All right. Thank you, Sana. Thank you, Nabil. We will now enter into the first rebuttal time. Each debater will have 15 minutes for his rebuttal, starting with Nabil. Are you ready? Almost. Whenever you're ready, come on up. When I uh, when I started earlier today, I was like, man, what am I going to do with a 15 minute rebuttal? I know what I'm going to do with a 15 minute rebuttal. All right. <laughs> now, um, let's take a look at what Osama has done. He has provided three lines of reasoning in order to show that his position is accurate, mine's not. Number one, he quoted uh, Old Testament prophecies, um, saying that we should expect Jesus to have been uh, killed on the cross in the Old Testament. Number two, uh, he spoke about the reliability of the New Testament, saying that uh, the New Testament must be reliable, uh, and, and it seems like he asserts a perfect way in order for us to be able to use it at all. And number three, he starts talking about the deity of Christ. I'm going to just say it right now, number three is entirely irrelevant to this debate. If you'd like to debate this topic, I would love to do it with you. Um, but that is not at all the topic for tonight. It has nothing to do with tonight. Um, so I'm going to leave that aside for now. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want you to, to follow along. We're going on a fun ride now. Uh, what was it that I said to you we were going to look at when we're uh, discussing the evidence for the case of Jesus Christ, death on the cross, and resurrection? Number one, direct evidence, and number two, supporting evidence. I said direct evidence is the strongest stuff. That's the stuff where it's people saying exactly what happened, eyewitnesses making accounts, people hearing from the eyewitnesses, writing them down, as strong as history gets. And what direct evidence did Osama provide for anything? Nothing. For every single point I made, I provided direct evidence and supporting evidence, direct evidence and supporting evidence. He provided not one shred of direct evidence in the whole half hour we just listened to him. Every single thing was supporting evidence, and supporting evidence itself was logically fought on almost all cases. So, number one, Osama had no evidence. Mark that, write that down, and uh, you can put a little dash in my name next to it. Osama had no direct evidence. Dash is your question. Um, <laughs> What, what did Osama have? He had supporting evidence, and he started off by using the Old Testament. His approach was to use Old Testament verses, usually Psalm 91 and Isaiah 53, in order to show that Jesus must not have died on the cross and risen from the dead. Now, what was the presupposition? Actually, let's take a step back. What is Osama doing? He is doing what I would call mutilating the text. He actually absolutely ignores everything that's clearly said about Jesus and goes to things which may or may not have to do with Jesus at all. For example, what does Matthew say about Jesus' life and death? It says that Jesus is going to die on the cross, Matthew 16. It says Jesus is going to die on the cross, Matthew 18. It says Jesus is going to die on the cross, Matthew 20. Luke chapter 9 says Jesus is going to die on the cross. Luke chapter 18 says Jesus is going to die on the cross. Mark says it multiple times. John says it multiple times. Every time there's a clear statement about what is going to happen to Jesus, it says he is going to die at the cross. Is there any indication Jesus said anything otherwise? No. He himself says it clearly multiple times. What does Osama do with those verses? Pretend they do not exist. Notice, instead of going to verses where it clearly says what Jesus is going to do, Osama goes to verses written thousands of years earlier, maybe hundreds of years earlier, which may or may not have anything to do with the uh, topic for tonight's discussion. Clear statements, Jesus says, I'm going back to Jerusalem, and they're going to crucify me. Ignore that. Uh, I'm going to back. I'm going back to die on the cross. Ignore that. First in John, and it was finished. He was killed. Ignore that. All the verses where Jesus said clearly he was going to die. Ignore it. Ignore it. Ignore it. Go to other verses to twist them to make them sound like they're saying he was not going to die on the cross. That has been the modus operandi for today. And I tell you, we should not stand for this kind of thing. How else do we know that he uh, he actually mutilates the text? He goes to Psalm and Isaiah. Why would he go to Psalms 91 in Isaiah? Well, first off, we know when we read Psalm 91, it says nothing about a Messiah. Not Virtually no one believed it to be a messianic verse. So Psalm is appealing to it as if it were. 
However, it's just a psalm of protection. Anyone can read Psalm 91. It, it's talking about general people. In fact, it says you. If you do this, if you do that, it's verses about the person who can read the psalm and protection over that person. Isaiah 53, however, it does talk about the Messiah. Lots of people believe it to be messianic. But should I go through a point-by-point point defense for what Osama has said? No, I shouldn't honor him with such a response. And why? Because he's mutilating the text. He ignores clear statements and goes to unclear statements in order to make his case. Now, anyone who does that is not being honest with their interpretation of the text. If you go to a document that's written right after Jesus' life where it said he died on the cross, he said he was going to die on the cross, and you say, oh, ignore this. And then you go to an Old Testament verse, which is written, by the way, in a poetic language, no clear statement there. It's not necessarily historical. It's poetic. You go to these verses, and you interpret them to mean what you want to make them mean. Why should we give that any weight? This is a historical event, is it not? Jesus died on the cross. That's historical. Why not go to the historical accounts of Jesus' life? Why ignore them wholesale? I tell you, because when you look at the evidence that is direct, you can come up with no conclusion except that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Look at the type of acrobatics that need to be done in order to avoid this conclusion. Finally, another reason why I'm not going to honor him with a response to Isaiah 53 is because it had nothing to do with my case. Do you know how debates work? The debate works where one opponent goes and he provides his positive case for why something happened. I provided a historical case for why Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the dead. The opponent is supposed to respond to the case. His response had nothing to do with my case. Notice, I gave you multiple lines of reasoning for why Jesus died on the cross. I said we can know from all the written evidence, all the early evidence, first generation, second generation Christian evidence, as well as Jewish evidence, as well as Gentile evidence, as well as practice of Roman crucifixion and the scholarly consensus that Jesus died on the cross. How much of that did he cover? None. And he expects me to respond to something entirely irrelevant? I don't think so. Uh, let's actually look at what the topic at hand is. What about the empty tomb? I provided multiple lines of reasoning for the empty tomb. Four I provided. How many did he respond to? None. Not the direct evidence, not the indirect evidence. What about beyond that, that his followers believed he had been risen? How much of that did he respond to? None. Not the direct nor the indirect. And how about that his opponents believed he had been risen from the dead? He didn't respond to that at all. I'm wondering if he even listens to my opening statement. And then he says that I brought up the, the Trinity. I didn't bring up the Trinity. That also makes me wonder if he was listening to my opening statement. I wonder if he was hearing something that I wasn't saying. Uh, Osama, I really want to discuss these issues with you. I know you're a learned man, and I hope you actually address what I'm saying the next time you're up here. Um, so I have to ask the question, um, what did happen to Jesus? Uh, if Osama's case is entirely based off of what didn't happen to him, um, and to rehash. He's saying all the things everyone said happened to him did not happen to him. Um, what actually did happen to Jesus? Well, he quotes from the Quran, chapter 4, verse 157, that it was made to appear to people as if he died on the cross. Notice he provides no reasoning for this conclusion. There is no reasoning for this conclusion except that the Quran says it, therefore I will believe it. But let's follow this conclusion out. Osama has already hinted at this, and let's follow this conclusion out to its natural end. If Jesus actually uh, is who Islam says he is, we have a major dilemma. Fact number one, the Quran states that Jesus was a messenger of Allah and a prophet of Islam. Everyone in this room will agree with that. The Quran says Jesus was a prophet and a messenger of Islam. Number two, the Quran states that Jesus won a number of followers. It mentions his disciples multiple times, even saying um, that they will be given victory until the end of the days. And we'll discuss that in a moment. So number one, Jesus was a messenger of Allah. And number two, Jesus won a number of followers. Number three, the Quran states that the Injil, or the Gospel, was given as a guidance. If you want to read chapter 3, verse 3 of the Quran with me in English, it says, He has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it, and to reveal the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people. So we know that at some point, God revealed something that was called the Injil. I'm not going to necessarily say that it was the Gospel that we have today, although I do believe it was. All we need for this case right now is that something was revealed called the Injil. Number four, the Quran states that Jesus' followers will be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection. You look at chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and it says that, I will make those who follow thee, Jesus, superior to those who reject thee until the day of resurrection. So it says that Jesus' followers will be superior to the others, 
to those who reject Jesus until the day of resurrection. So far, what do we have? Jesus, the prophet of Allah, with many uh, followers, given the Injil, those guys were supposed to be uh, unbeatable until the day of resurrection. However, if there were first century Jews who converted to Islam at the preaching of Jesus, they did not last very long. There is no one who came away from Jesus' life thinking that he did not die on the cross, that he did not claim to be God. Everyone who walked away from Jesus said, yeah, they claimed to be God. He claimed to be God and he died on the cross. The Jews say he claimed to be God, that's why they crucified him. The Christians say he claimed to be God, that's why they worshipped him. No one came away saying he didn't claim to be God. So where are these Muslims that are supposed to be uh, uppermost until the day of resurrection according to Islam? Fact is, if there were any, they didn't last long at all. Also, Islam teaches that Allah deceived people into believing that Jesus had died on the cross. Chapter 4, verse 157, again, I'll read it this time. We killed Christ Jesus, the Son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, is what they said in both. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. So it says, it was made to appear to them as if Jesus died. Now, who made it appear to them? Well, someone says, oh, it wasn't God. Well, that, he's, he's digging a hole for himself. We can discuss that in a moment. That average Muslim position from the first generation of Muslims all the way to the, the, the most important um, commentators on the Quran all agreed that Jesus, was, uh, Jesus' face was put upon someone else by Allah. And that is why um, they believe in what's called the substitution theory. You look at all the commentators and all the positions from the Salaf era or the first three generations of Islam, they all believe that Allah was the one doing the deceiving, but Osama has a different conclusion, which is even worse. And we can discuss that if need be. Fact number seven. The Quran states that Allah helped the spread of Christianity. You look at chapter 61, verse 14 of the Quran, and it says that the disciples of Allah said, we are helpers of Allah. So a party of the children of Israel believed, and another party disbelieved. Then we aided those who believed against their enemies. So God said, we aided these Christians. Well, what's the problem here? What's the sum total here? The Quran says that, number one, Jesus had, was a messenger of Allah who had disciples. He was given the Injil, and this Injil and these disciples were meant to be superior until the end of times, according to the Quran, chapter 3, verse 55. Where are these guys? What happened to them? Why is there no notice of them? The only people who were superior after Jesus' time were in any way superior were the Christians that we know today. Paul, uh, James, Peter, these are the only ones that were superior in any way. If you want to say superior in military might, then we have the Roman army, and they certainly didn't look Muslim at all. The only people who were ever superior, according to the Quran itself, Jesus' disciples were to be superior. The only ones who were, were ones who looked just as Christian as we do today. So the Quran has an extreme problem. Not to mention, not to mention, if Jesus did not die on the cross, then what did happen to him? What, what did happen to him? Do we get an alternative explanation? No, we do not. We don't get any defense. We don't have any idea of what actually happened to him. Because I tell you, if Jesus Christ was raised to God, as the Quran says he was, and he was not killed and crucified on the cross, then we have huge problems. We have, number one, an incompetent Messiah who was not able to tell his disciples that he was not killed on the cross. They all came away believing he was killed on the cross. We have, number two, an incompetent God who chose the incompetent Messiah. And number three, we have incompetent disciples who were preaching an Islamic message and all of a sudden changed their message for no reason whatsoever. This is what is required by the Islamic position. An incompetent uh, set of believers, an incompetent Messiah, and an incompetent God. I will not believe this. I will not believe that God is incompetent, that He can't pick a Messiah whose disciples could follow His message for no less than a few years. I will not believe that. Yet that's what the Quran is telling me to believe. I will not believe that God would deceive people into thinking Jesus Christ died on the cross, thereby creating Christianity. Because no one would have believed that Christianity was true if it were not made to appear as if Jesus had died on the cross. So it's God's fault that Christianity was started according to Islam. It's the largest religion that ever contended against Islam, al-Haq, according to Muslims. The largest religion to ever contend against Islam was the one that God created. And it causes everyone who believes it to believe in shirk. In other words, the only forgive, unforgivable sin. God thereby consigned people to hell, according to the Islamic view. And not just some, the vast majority of believers in this world. Now you tell me, why should I believe these things? I need a massive amount of evidence to believe any of this. 
It's possibly true, maybe all my evidence is bad, but in order to overturn my reasoning and my evidence, I need a mountain of evidence. I really do. And we don't have one shred of direct evidence for anything Osama has said. In fact, all we have is supporting evidence for conclusions that had nothing to do with my opening case. This is an historical question. Did Jesus die on the cross? And the reason that's so important is because if he died on the cross, then why was he seen later? I say it's because he was risen. However, Osama has not been able to address any of my case, not one aspect of my case. And all he has provided is conjecture and unrelated arguments, mutilating the clear statements of Jesus and his followers from documents that came from the first century, the documents we should turn to in order to see whether the historical event is true or not. I ask you, Osama, you are my friend now. Uh, I ask you, please respond to the case and let me know why you are Muslim for strong reasons and not for reasons that, that make me wonder if you're being honest. Okay, according, um, and I will make those who follow you over or above or more preferred about, uh, uh, upon, more preferred than those who re uh, reject faith from the pagans and others. According to uh, the, uh, the Sound of Dictionary, folk means race and status, made them more powerful, given more preference. And Christians uh, today, those who uh, have doubts about Trinity, are also considered Muslims because they would be uh, Trinitarians. Uh, I mean, they would be Unitarians, I apologize, monotheists and not polytheists. And uh, that's why the Christians are misguided. We call them misguided, uh, not cursed ones. Uh, we say in the Noble Verse, chapter, uh, chapter 1, uh, we say, uh, well, which is the Jews, those who are not cursed. Please make us not among those who are cursed. Those are the Jews and the pagans, nor from among those who are misguided. And amen. Uh, nor among those who are misguided. The misguided ones are the Christians. Christians who are monotheists, even if they believe Christ was crucified, can still be considered Muslims and can still win paradise. Allah Almighty made this very clear in Noble Verses chapter 7, verses, uh, verse 159, uh, Noble Verse chapter 5, verse 44, and Noble Verse chapter 2, verse 62. Uh, and also Noble Verse chapter 5, verse 82 says, Christians are full of love, harmony, and mercy. Okay? So that that's a point refuted. It says here, and he also said, Allah deceived people to believe that Jesus was crucified. I already explained that Shukriha lahum versus Shabbahna lahum. We made it appear to them. Allah Almighty never said that. He never said, I made that lie. Or Allah Almighty never took part of any lie. And by the way, you know, I quoted uh, the scriptures and that Jesus himself associated to him in, uh, in Matthew, in Luke chapter 4, verses uh, 10 through 12, and Matthew chapter 4, verses. Five through ten. I mean, Jesus is so you know associated Psalm ninety one to him. Okay, show me where any other book other than Psalm ninety one that speaks about saving the Messiah from striking his foot against the stone. You have none except Psalm ninety one. So my only conclusion is to associate Psalm ninety one to him. Okay, which and by the way, the names of uh, and the chapter numbers and all that this is all modern stuff. Okay, uh, back then it was all just quotations without numbering system. Uh, so, you know, show, show me any verse in the Bible other than Psalm 91 that says Jesus, Messiah will not uh, strike, who will be saved, who will be lifted, that even his foot will not strike the stone. Allah Almighty hated the followers of Christ. Yes, the Sabians and other minority Christians still exist today. They were not wiped out as uh, the Romans and the, and the polytheists of the Christians wanted to wipe them out. Allah Almighty did hate them, yes. 
Okay? And by the way, uh, the, follow the true followers of Christ today are the Muslims. Okay? They are and all monotheists. Okay? Because Christ came to teach the oneness of God. No, don't, do not call me good. No one is good except God alone. I, go, I return to my, to your God and my God. Okay? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Okay? All these quotes that Jesus said are Islamic quotes. Um, by the way, you did raise the Trinity uh, issue. You said Jesus was God in flesh. Uh, so I responded to that. I blew that away for you. Uh, test and also you said that testimonies of early Christians uh, date as early as two to three years. And he quoted the uh, first book of Corinthians. Paul's letters were not original writings of Paul. I will get into that very shortly. And prove to you that all of your testimonies are uh, doubtful because you, can, you cannot trust a single account from the New Testament. I only give you few, uh, very few uh, errors uh, about the, uh, your accounts, and I, you know, I did not have time to get into it. But I will show you up right now. All these one. You also referred to uh, Prophet Muhammad sayings in your opening present uh, statement, saying that hundreds of uh, they were documented uh, hundreds of years after his death. That's not true. Many of the Prophet sayings were documented during his lifetime, and we do have categorization of. The hadiths, the sayings of Prophet Muhammad. We have the mutawatirs, which are the strongest and most authentic. We have nine main volumes, nine, nine main volumes of uh, the Sunni uh, or, or the hadith collections of the Prophet. A mutawatir hadith is a hadith that exists multiple times in each uh, in, in each uh, volume and exists in multiple or all the volumes. This is a very very strong narration that has many eyewitnesses. Many people narrated it, and so therefore it is true. It's like the, the sayings that we have today, you know, one bird is better than a hand, better than ten on the tree. You know, these things you inherited from your parents and your people, Proverbs that you inherited. Same thing. They were common knowledge, okay? So these Mutawat hadiths are among the, are our strongest hadiths in our database. So we follow those. Uh, we also have the had, had hadiths. They, they have thin sources, uh, narrators, but, you know, not not, you know, not, uh, uh, they're not narrated by so many people or so many sources, but they're, they're so, their chain of narrators are very, very strong. They're called Ahad, Ahad Hadith, and the word Ahad is derived from Ahad, which is the Arabic word for absolute one, which is one of the attributes of Allah Almighty, Al Ahad. And then we have Da'if and Mawdu Hadith and Mawdu Hadith, which are very, very weak and fabricated Hadith. Okay, so we do have categorizations of Hadith, sir. You do not have anything like this in the Bible. Uh, Paul was an enemy of Christ, okay, uh, and uh, who claimed that Jesus appeared to him. Paul was delusional. My response to you is, Paul was delusional, and according, uh, and he wasn't even sure what appeared to him. He himself stated in the book of Acts, in his testimony, uh, about uh, Jesus' appearance to him. It wasn't Jesus, but rather it was a cloud with a loud sound of thunder and unknown sounds that would appear to him. And he said this was Jesus, okay? And Paul said also in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 40, I think that I too, I think that I too have the Spirit of God. You think, you think, I don't see, I don't say, I think I see my wife. No, I see my wife. She's sitting over there. Okay? I don't say, oh, I think I see her. Because if I say that, that tells you my vision is poor. Okay? So you don't just say, oh, I think I probably have the Spirit of God in me. No. You don't say that. Especially when every word you speak is considered. Quran or Revelation, okay? You just don't say things like that, okay? So that's that. He said, Quran said, Jesus did not get crucified and that there's no evidence for it. Psalm 91, chapter 91, Psalm 91, uh, 116, 118, and Isaiah 52 and 53 are evidence that prove that. Uh, Osama, uh, Osama provided no evidence that refuted my arguments. Here they come, sir, they're coming. Osama, uh, verses, uh, gave, Osama's verses gave no proof about Jesus being saved from the crucifixion. Again, Psalm 91 and Psalm, oh, he said Psalm 91 is, is a song of protection. Jesus did, did link uh, Psalm 91 to himself in Luke 4, chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, and Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. Now, the like, accounts of your, what the, the what Bible theologians say, those who translated the Bibles, in the, what, what they say in their commentaries about the Bible. The Catholic Encyclopedia, the New Advent. Go to newadvent.org slash Cathen, C A T H E N, slash 14530 small a dot HTM. Read this uh, text, this sentence. No book of 
ancient times has come down to us exactly as it left the hands of its author. All have been in some way altered, changed, modified. Okay? And here uh, in one of the manuscripts, this is the most uh, this is the most interesting, I don't want to say ironic because I don't want to sound rude, but uh, there's a manuscript called P73. I, I saw this in the uh, Bart Berman and James White debate that I purchased. Um, you know, it's people writing manuscripts, and, and, they, and you know, these manuscripts, manuscripts have uh, names. P73, which is one of your manuscripts, ironically, it's called Pop uh, Papyrus uh, P73. It's a manuscript that is half canonized, half, half of it is part of your Bible today, and half of it is thrown out as heretic, as infidels, as false writings. One author, one manuscript, half of it is in the Bible, half of it is outside the Bible, thrown out as a lie. For God's sake, how can, how, how can you have something like this? Okay? Watch the Mark Herman and James White uh, debate. It's very beautiful. They talk in depth about these uh, manuscripts, the P's and all that. But this was one striking example that I had to use in this debate. Okay? Gospel of Matthew, uh, the New American Bible, commentary, page uh, 1008, says uh, about the book of Gospel of Matthew. Thank you. The unknown, uh, the author, uh, the unknown author, whom we shall continue to call Matthew for the sake of convenience, you know, drew no, or, uh, drew no only up the gospel according to blah, 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 anyway. So, you know, they, they, the author is not known. They don't know who wrote it, but they're going to call him Matthew for the sake of argument or convenience. The uh, Gospel of Mark, here in the New American Bible, page 1764, the commentary says, although the book is anonymous, means no one knows who wrote it, anonymous, apart from the ancient headings, etc. And also here it says there is no direct internal evidence of authorship. That's uh, New, New International Bible, NIV Bible Commentary, page 1488. By the way, if you want to look at the bibliography of the books, the ICM number and all that, visit my website, answering-christianity.com slash authors underscore gospels dot htm. Okay? You'll see tons of codes on, the, on those. I'm just going to give you some of them. Um, books of uh, First and Second Peter. Uh, it says here, nevertheless, acceptance of Second Peter in the New Testament canon met with great resistance in the early church. The oldest certain, the old, the oldest certain reference to it comes from Oregon in Oregon, Oregon, I think, in the not Oregon, but see, Oregon in the early third century. In the early third century, okay, that's when it was written. Okay, so he tells you about all this. Oh, testimonies, you know, two to three years old, and that's bogus. Among modern scholars, there is wide agree uh, agreement uh, that's, that Second Peter is a pseudonymous work, i.e., one written by a la later, uh, later author who attributed to Peter. So Peter was not the author. The book of Acts, although the author does not name himself, evidence outside the scriptures uh, and inferences from the book itself lead to the conclusion that it was Luke. That's uh, NIV Bible Commentary, page 1643. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Gospel of Luke, although the author does not name himself, again, evidence uh, outside the scripture. Uh, uh, did I say that? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I uh, just mentioned that. And also here, Book of Hebrews, the writer of this letter does not identify himself, but he was obviously well known to the original recipients. That's NIV Bible. Uh, page 1856, that's about the book of Hebrews, which no one knows who wrote it. Gospel of John, the final editing of the gospel and arrangement in its present uh, form, uh, in its present form probably dates from between uh, years 90 to 100. Traditionally, uh, uh, Ephesus uh, has been favored as a place of composition, so they don't know who wrote it. Also here, and that's by the way, new, uh, the New American Bible, page uh, uh, 1,136, thank you. Uh, also it says here, uh, Hallman Illustrated Study Bible, uh, page uh, 1,540, about the Gospel of John. Many scholars of the past two centuries have denied that John wrote this book because of many fabrications in it. Here also, uh, another quote says, critical analysis makes it difficult to accept the idea that the Gospel is now, stands, that the gospel as it now stands was written by one person. This is the, the Gospel of John, 
the, from the New American Bible, commentary page 1136. And also here, um, thank you. <laughs> I got one cheerleader here. <laughs> uh, the Gospel of, uh, first the book of John, rather, first book of John says the, uh, Unlike uh, most of the New, uh, New Testament letters, 1 John does not tell us who the author is. Okay, this is from the New, uh, NIV Bible, New International Version Bible, uh, page 1904. The letter, and here another quote says, the letter is too difficult. I'm sorry, did I run out of time? Okay, thank you. The letter is too difficult to date with, uh, uh, with precision. That's the New International Version Bible, page 1905. Book of Revelation, same thing, you know. Uh, Old Testament uh, books, same thing. In the New Te Old Testament, by the way, we ironically read the story, of the, the details of this, the, 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 the burial of Moses, how Moses was buried in the books of Moses. Okay? Imagine, you know, how he wrote this about himself, I have no idea. Okay? And by the way, I mean, there's also morally questionable things in the Bible. If you look at Song of Songs, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, if only you were a brother to me who was nursed from my mother's breast, you know, and she, then she talks about uh, taking him to a home, to their bed, and, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, making love and things like that. You know, she's singing about her lover, you know, and wishing that he were her brother. Incestuous fantasy. Thank you. Okay, well, we have come to the, the uh, second rebuttal. And while we're at this point, I just want to take the time to remind you that Osama and Nabil are our guests today.